Hello, Mr. Charles. It's a great pleasure having you with us this new meeting of Hemp um, Mastermind Group. Uh, it is a uh, Mr. Charles is perhaps one of the most influential uh, uh, persons in the hemp industry in Australia. He has not only been a pioneer, but he is an inventor of his own decorticator. And which is got relevance all around the world. Mr. Charles, congratulations and welcome with us. Thank you, Ramon. Lovely to be with you. Thank you very much. With us, we have also uh, some invitees. And also, I want you to know that we will be posting this uh, video in, in our social media. Charles, tell us how did you end up in the hemp business very briefly before we enter into heavy metal? Well, I will, I'm going to do one thing, Ramon, and I recommend to everybody, you know, when you are on a Zoom call, so you, you change your name so that it is relevant to the topic. Okay. And that's what I'm doing now. You'll see it's a different name now. Textile and composite industries. So I got, I'm not the inventor of the world's best decorticator. I am the chief executive of textile and composite industries that is the inventor of the world's best decorticator. And this came about, TCI, this company has been established for for 27 years, Ramon, since 1994. And nine years ago, I was asked by Adrian Clark, the inventor and the founder, and his brother, Anthony, to help them commercialize the decorticator. And Nine years later, sorry, um, four years later, three years later, Adrian Clark died from cancer, partly because of the stress caused by hemp, how difficult this journey is. And so for six years, I have been the chief executive of TCI. And I agreed, Ramon, to participate in this, in this industry because industrial hemp is a crucial, crucial factor in the future of humanity. So that's how I got into hemp. I was asked by one of my clients to help them commercialize, and I'm still with hemp because it is one of the most important industries for our planet. And anybody who is interested in hemp will benefit enormously from understanding why hemp is such a crucial factor in humanity's future. I do, I do agree with you, and that is a common a feeling and emotion that most hamsters that I have met since I came to this industry are, um, uh, we share in a basic, in a daily basis. The idea is that this plan, yes, it's a difficult journey. It's a marathon, like I tell most people, but uh, we have to collaborate in one way or another to keep this plane up and running. Correct. We have to collaborate and we have to share ideas. And, and I want to, I want to give you one, you know, there are other people who are copying our decorticator. There are other decorticators available and it doesn't matter. I was a lawyer for 20 years before I stopped in 1993 to become a motivational speaker and to become a business consultant, 20 years. And, and in the legal profession in Australia, there are 25,000 legal practices. 25,000, like competition doesn't matter. Have a look at how many mo different motor cars there are available competition how many hairdressers so our decorticator will 
process up to up to 10,000 tonnes of stalk over the course of a year. Hello, David. Lovely to see you there in the background. And, and so from a good fibre crop, you will get 10 tonnes per hectare. So 1,000 hectares will give you 10,000 tonnes of fibre. Don't worry about the seed. 10,000 tonnes. Now, one decorticate, one D8 decorticate, will process that operating at 100 hours a week, 5,000 hours a year to two tonnes an hour to process 10,000 tonnes. So one decorticator will do 1,000 hectares. Now, now, the, the exciting idea for hemp is this. If Australia, which last year grew no more than 4,000 hectares, if Australia grew 1 million hectares of hemp fibre, fibre crop, 1 million hectares, that would produce 10 million tonnes of stalk, that would produce 3 million tonnes of fibre, that would produce 2 million tonnes of yarn for textiles, that would represent 2% of the global market, the global annual market for yarn for textiles. So 1 million hectares equals 2% of the textile market, let alone all the other nine categories of products we can make with hemp. In other words, in other words, to go from, and by the way, 1 million hectares would require 1,000 of our decorticators. That's why I'm not worried about competition. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, and our decorticator gives a magnificent return on investment. To a, if you have 1,000 hectares or a cooperative that has anywhere from 200 hectares, that the return on investment is what drives our thinking. Adrian Clark got into this business to help farmers be more profitable. And we say Australian and American farmers who grow a fibre crop or a dual crop, they can earn between $3,000 and $6,000 profit per hectare. That's Australian dollars, $3,000 to $6,000 per hectare profit, per crop. And so we are, that's why Adrian got into hemp, so that farmers could become more profitable. And so our, we are not interested in selling a decorticator if farmers aren't going to be profitable. I would not be in the hemp industry if farmers are not going to be profitable. And the numbers that we have developed over 27 years, everybody along the whole supply chain from the suppliers of seed to the farmers, all the way down to the end markets, everybody can make money out of hemp products. And that is why Adrian developed our decorticator. And I promise you, everybody watching this, you can make excellent returns. Now, one other point, Ramon, this is important. And you mastermind looking, Peter. Lovely to see you there, people, Peter, as well. And who's the other gentleman who I haven't met before? I'm Kane. Hello, Kane. Hello. Um, I'm Abel. That's um, <laughs> the the we reason... also have Mr. Yes, Hilario. Marios. Hilario. Spin it around a Hilarios. Good. Right. Hello. Good to meet you. Everyone's in black. What's the story? Gosh, We're in is... oh, well, <laughs> well, 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 summer. Where are you? <laughs> Yeah. Here, here is here is the here is the reason why Adrian wanted farmers to be successful, profitable, sustainable. Because, as a matter of philosophy, profitable family farms are the key to preserving human freedom. Exactly right. Because if all farming is corporatized and we're all living in the city, we are 
under the control of government. My parents were refugees from Hungary. They came to Australia in 1949. They went through the war in the heart of Europe in Hungary. And my dad could see, and this is why I'm in the philosophy behind hemp is so important for the future of humanity, because my dad experienced that is people on the land who can tell the government to get stuffed. And I say to government right now, most of their activities are disgraceful, are illegal, are unconstitutional. I tell them to get stuffed. Politicians are liars and cheats and frauds overwhelmingly. And if we, the people, keep putting up with bullshit from government, we are in trouble. Hemp, if you had a hemp farm, you are growing all of your food, clothing, shelter. You can tell the government like this, okay? That's my message to everybody watching this. Hemp will enable you to say this to the government. Mr. Uh, Mr. Charles, um, I strongly uh, share your feelings. Um, half of my problems in my master mind group uh, team <laughs> is because I also think the same and I share the same thoughts and I speak it up. Uh, I do agree with you. This is a uh, cannabis basically is more political than technology than technology itself, because the technology exists there to resolve all the problems and save the planet using the plant. Could, that is basically it. While Charles is there, could Kane perhaps explain to Charles what you've been doing? Um, before we go to there, could I throw in one question for Charles? Talking these big numbers here with all these decorticators and so on, bring it back to one, uh, one decorticator unit sitting uh, on foundations in a tin shed somewhere. Uh, how, how wide is the catchment pools from farm to decorticator where it works effectively? Um, okay. If, if this, it won't be 5,000K, it'll be a lot uh, more than 10K. No, no. It'll be somewhere yeah. between. Where, see, uh, we think of wheat growing, where wheat growing in WA grew up, or um, where a farmer could go from his farm with his horse and dray, take his wheat to the, uh, the railway. Uh, railway siding or whatever it is that has the wheat bin and then go home in the same day. So there is a there is a, a limit somewhere, oh. Oh. somewhere around that is, oh. the, is the catchment oh. plant, the effective catchment oh. plant. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Yeah. You are coming from a misconception, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Most decorticators are fixed units. Yes. Our decorticator is designed to, to sit on the back of a three-ton truck yeah. to be able to move from farm to farm. Right. It is far more efficient to take the decorticator to the farm than to have the stalk brought to the decorticator. Uh, yes, I, I, I quite believe in that one because hemp fiber in its, in its various forms is a relatively low value per cubic meter per ton. So no, uh, no, 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 you're doing that no. the ongoing. Peter, it is herd. The fiber is high value per cubic meter. The, the herd is low value per cubic meter because one ton of herd occupies 10 cubic meters. Yes. Yeah. Where sand, one ton of sand occupies one cubic meter. Okay, so now bear in mind in Australia, most herd that is used for building in Australia is imported from the Netherlands. So guess what? It is still even shipping it from the Netherlands worth doing. Mm. So there's a misconception around the transportability. I'm talking about the stalk. The hemp I agree stalk. with you, Mr. Charles, if I may, I absolutely agree with you especially in Western Australia, that where we have the largest concentration of hemp homes on earth, still we don't grow, we bring it from the Netherlands and it still is profitable for people to build it. Could, yes. Could we, can I just make it? Um, we've got here Kane at the moment, Charles. 
And you remember we've been talking about making cars and batteries and things like that from industrial hemp. This man here, Kane, has done it. So I'd like to hand over to Kane and you'd like to introduce yourself, please, and yes. explain to- I'm Kane, Kane Teleski, nice to meet you. Uh, I haven't heard much about hemp before. As I was saying to the gentleman here, this, this is very new for me. I was only introduced about a month ago. Prior to this, I had no knowledge whatsoever about hemp. I've been in the automotive industry for the past 45 years. And I have been in the racing industry in the 70s. I used to race at Claremont Raceway with a gentleman by the name of Jamie Gard, very well known in the industry. And uh, about a month ago, Victor, whatever his name Ventures. is, yes, okay. came to me and says, why don't you build these cars out of hemp? I said, well, what is that? <laughs> and uh, he gave me some information. So then I decided to do a bit more study in it. And uh, I met a lot of people in the hemp industry now. Apparently there's a quite a few different branches of this. They brought me the hemp to my factory. I says, can you make some proof that this actually works? So I decided to make some plates. I used resins and all the other chemicals that I needed to use. And um, yeah, the outcome is very impressive. Very, very impressive. In fact, the strength of it, because I use carbon fiber, fiberglass. And um, yeah, this is uh, very real stuff. <laughs> So I'll be more than happy, but I have built an electric car complete. I've actually tested, certified it. And I've also built a hybrid car. I've got a factory here in Wangara. And uh, I've been to China many times and we're ready to go in production uh, for these cars. And we're just trying to finalize some final funds raising. And I've been promised with a number of people, unfortunately, nobody's willing to put their hands in the pocket. They reckon that they're all carrying snakes there. I get bitten, so. Well, um, it is uh, very common in this business. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, people that uh, promise you everything that at the end of the day, all mm -hmm. they're doing is stealing your ideas. Mm -hmm. This business is very complex, mm -hmm. very complicated. About the electric cars, actually, it's not complex at all because it's very, now it's pretty well known out there. I think my problem was that I have been dealing with wrong people. I have a six directors in my company, I call them six dummies that mm -hmm. have done nothing. I'm a technical person. When it comes to finances, I have no knowledge whatsoever. So when it comes to cars, I can talk all the technical, but when it comes to finance, I have zero knowledge. And unfortunately I have been dealing with dummies. And um, I realize now after meeting a couple of uh, high ranking investors here, they said that you need to restructure a company. You don't need directors, you need people with money. So they said that you are ready for production. I've, they've seen my car, that I've driven my car, fully electric, it's a supercar. I've done drawings for SUVs. I've done drawings for sedans. I've been in limousines for the past 30 years. I've made the longest limousine in, in Australia, six wheeler in 1994. Uh, wow. the government refused to do it. So I said, no, I'm going to do it with my money. If it files, I'll cut it in half and I'll take it to the tip. That's, that's the outcome. So they made me six months driving that car with no passengers, but cement inside to the weight of um, 85 kilos per the person. person yeah. And I did that for six months. And six months later, we did another test. The car was stronger than the normal sedan. Finally, they registered. And today, uh, 20 years later, the car is still driving around without any faults at all. I've done a lot of Hummers. I've done a lot of uh, Chrysler C300s. I've done Lamborghini limousine. I've been on the newspaper, I've done all that. So my experience is extreme. Unfortunately, uh, being in Perth, I'm very lucky. When it comes to lifestyle, I'm very unlucky when it comes to business. <laughs> I hope you're okay in love. I, I love Perth, but when it comes to business, unfortunately, I have to say that. Anything I do here, it takes 10 times longer than in another country. Mm -hmm. I've been to China a million times. I'm actually honored to have a visa for five years. The only foreigner that had this five year visa to China can go in and out anytime. I have a factory in Nantong. Um, when I do things over there, it happens 24 hours. If I wanted something done today, it means today. Unfortunately, here, if you want hey, to. Today, hey, I have a question. I have a question. Please do. Are you happy? Oh, I'm very happy. I mean, I think I showed them. <laughs> I'm very happy, very healthy, and I enjoy life. You are too. Okay. Now, because you know why? I put life and a business in a two different areas. They're not. They cannot be blending. <laughs> I was. I was. I for everybody watching this, I was a lawyer for twenty years, and it is remarkable. 
remarkable how happy people are when they're building a business, but when they have succeeded in making lots of money, then they become bored and they fight amongst each other, you see. So there's a real benefit in not being too successful too early. In, um, in... I'm going to disagree with that because I'll tell you why I'll disagree with that. I'm a classical pianist and I have been for the past 30 years. I'm an illusionist and magician on stage. I have been doing it for 20 years. I've done a lot of shows here in Perth, Singapore, Thailand. So yeah. I have a lots and lots of hobbies. Doing electric car, it's not because... I want to make money. It's not because I want to build my name, but I think it's going to contribute towards humanity. Yes. So for me, mm -hmm. if I succeed with that, it'll be just another hobby that I'm doing because my, my profession is a hobby. Mm -hmm. I'm not an engineer. Well, I'm an engineer, but I don't classify myself an engineer that I'm going to be full-time engineer. No, no, I have lots of lots of hobbies. Oh, we'll and I'm we'll that on stage. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I can use it. So anyway. I, um, I have a beautiful oh. grand piano. So when I go home, I don't have a business. I don't have anybody. I just have me and my piano, which I enjoy very, very much. Anyway, and, and I know Mr. Charles' uh, experience as an actor and comedian. <laughs> so now you guys are all... Oh so we can share things in common. So uh, I'd love to do it because I believe hemp is also something that will help humanity. Unfortunately, we have a lot of dummies in a high area that they can't see beyond their nose. They are sabotaged in their zone and they only see themselves internally. They don't know the real life out there. And that's unfortunate. And I don't think that will ever change. So I hope um, my electric cars can blend with the hemp. Charles and I were talking and we've discussed this in the past about a hemp bank or an agricultural bank here for Australia to get projects moving forward. Mm -hmm. so that we don't just talk about industrial hemp and how wonderful it is and then not go anywhere with it. And mm -hmm. so by doing that and getting investors with like-minded attitude towards things and bringing it to a project and making it happen, I think that is where we can make a difference. I mean, you look at Elon Musk, mm -hmm. he himself established things off his own back and he failed for a period of time, but then it started to come through and people invested in it. Sure. And it's, it's the most, unfortunately, when in business, it seems that when you're successful, everybody wants to know you. Yes. When you're first starting out, they don't want to know you because they think, I'm not quite sure, type of thing. So we have that mindset in people. Mm -hmm. But um, with this, investors out there, we're looking for green products mm -hmm. yes. to invest in. Yes. And they're the ones I think we should tap into because they're the ones that have got the mindset that we have, you know, and we want uh, to... Let me, let me say two things. One, I am leading a project team to raise a billion dollars of equity investment into hemp in Australia. And what we need, David, and you can manage this from Perth, your mastermind can manage this from Perth, we need deal flow. Now, I can do deal flow, but Kane, you need to understand this possibility that there is large amounts of money looking to come into hemp. So that's number one. A billion dollars we're going to have available in Australia. Number two, number two, the, the, um, oh, I forgot number two. That was number, so, okay, so deal flow is important. So that David, you sitting there, the imagination that you have or the idea, because Elon Musk and Amazon and Google all raise their money before they started. It is a lie that you need to have a complete project and cash I agree with you, yes. It's a lie, money is available. Now, the second thing is this, ESG and the circular economy. Do you know what ESG stands for? No. Economy and sustainability and governance. They were correct. Environment, sustainability, governance principles. No, sorry, environment, social governance, okay? Mm -hmm. Principles, plus the circular economy, minimizing waste. Now, these are two tidal waves, and I have crafted this message that hemp can surf the two tidal waves of ESG and circular economy to spectacular success. These are two global movements where investors must invest because this is the world is saying we want ESG behavior, we want circular economy behavior. And hemp can tap into those two movements. 
Well, uh, Charles, on behalf of our team, um, we will be more than happy to help you on that journey because we are in the same journey as well. So and by collaborating and joining forces, it's better than yeah. working separated. Yeah. Yes. So, so start to identify, and these these deals will be anywhere from two million to fifty million dollars. Okay. So the deals, so the conversations that you've had, Peter, your imagination that you've had, you go, okay, and just these one page deal sheets, because there is endless amounts of money looking to go somewhere. Just think about this, you, but also anyone watching this, if you had a billion dollars sitting in the bank, that would be a very dangerous thing to do today, because with the global indebtedness happening, your money is highly likely to devalue very quickly, can easily be snaffled by government, can easily be, be, be turned from a deposit into shares in a losing bank. People with money have a problem. They go, where are we going to invest? And my advice to them is absolutely hemp. And why? Because of is such a vast range of problems that hemp can solve. And that's what using money is all about. And Kane, precisely what you said, it's for the good of humanity. I, I agree with you about the money you said, with people with money having a problem. If you look at by law 2008 in Australia, where they passed in Canberra, that anybody, the banks can come at any time, take all your money, give you shares, because the banks, the institutions cannot collapse. So they can take all your money, give you shares, they can only give you enough to survive. So they can actually survive. This this law passed in 2018 mm -hmm. by law Australia 2018. If you have a look at it, it tells you yep. exactly. You're about to take the money mm -hmm. and give you shares without your permission. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's why they, that's why they that's hide so much the Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. From it's Bitcoin happening. Is the enemy of the banking system because you got control over your own money. Mm -hmm. So what was that saying? That's also happened in Greece and Cyprus in the last five years and yeah, Argentina. Yeah. It's a number of countries in South America, okay? Well, yes, uh, Mr. <laughs> Charles, um, your background as a Hungarian is very similar to mine as a Venezuelan because I also run away from that country due to exactly communist totalitarian mentality that does not allow people to express ideas or to evolve in capitalism. That's one of the issues I end up here in this beautiful country. Well, very um, glad. That was a very, that was a very visionary thing that you did, Ramon. When was that? Two thousand and one. I left Venezuela. And look at this people in who are trapped in South Africa now with the chaos in South Africa. And when I was practicing law in the early nineteen eighties, we had lawyers leave South Africa, leave with nothing, because they could see what was going to happen. And you were visionary Ramon for you to be able to see what was going to happen in Venezuela. Oh, thank you very much. I was involved in politics in Venezuela before I came here and uh, that also opened my eyes because yeah. my family is also involved in politics and military issues in Venezuela since. We were talking about Venezuela. We were talking about your vision. You understood what the risks were, what totalitarianism does, what socialism does and stupid people under 30 who do not understand socialism, many of them, particularly in America, think that socialism is social media, number one. Number two, in Australia, they are being educated that socialism is a wonderful, wonderful way where everybody will be equal. Bullshit, I say. Well, to be socialist, you've got to be first very rich to start with. Um, secondly, um, uh, it is anything that is social is good in the sense of mass collaboration, but on the other hand, it diminishes the, the spark of the people. You, the individual is the one that drives and changes. So um, it right. happens throughout history. And in this moment of shifting, where um, a lot of things are happening at the same time, I believe that uh, keeping individual freedom is essential at any cost for religious purposes, for mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, or you name it. it Correct. Is, it is my freedom, freedom is what makes us human. Without freedom, we are no different to animals. We are identical to animals. Mm. 
agree with you. And having said that, um, uh, this last uh, 19 of June, when we launched uh, the Home Hemp, Home Hemp Expo, Home Hemp Expo, we were lucky to have 28 speakers or uh, 28 CEOs from around the world that are um, focused exclusively for the for the hemp tree business or or hemp home building, made out of hemp. So uh, we are uh, very blessed and lucky that we also have that um, connection and network at your disposal when it's needed. Uh, one of our clients is uh, thinking in building, already applied for the license to build a smart hemp city in Thailand. Um, 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 I personally managing uh, a project in Sydney, in Malaysia, in Canada, Puerto Rico, and um, in um, helping another client in Mongolia. So yes, we have the technology, we have the, the, the set of the skills. Nonetheless, I also find that in, in, in this industry, because of the, uh, um, I have found in this industry that we have a lot of uh, good intentions, but, uh, but very, uh, uh, fully workable knowledge of how to expand this industry in a worldwide scale. Uh, my personal experience is coming from the oil and gas industry when we were built, when we were producing 1 million barrels per day and 15 years later, when the socialism took over the country, we were producing 5 million barrels per day. I was part of that wow. project not, management I, team. I, so, I was uh, very much, I was very much, in very much uh, aware of that amazing journey. So yes. in fact, it was BRICS, was the, was it the, which were the BRICS? There was Brazil, Russia, India, China, and then it became Venezuela, Brazil, you know, the, the big, and that was this amazing, wonderful opportunity for Venezuela and, and what you created, five million barrels a day is amazing. And then it's well, all gone. Well, Charles, when the country collapsed, and this is history, my man, when the country collapsed, the, and the government fired 18,000 engineers, the rest of the world was happy to hire us. <laughs> That's what would happen. Yes. yes. You, none of the engineers in the oil and gas industry in Venezuela lasted more than three months without a job in all countries when we started to leave. So yes, that, that experience is at the service of the cannabis industry. And it is my thinking that what you are betting or targeting $1 billion project is what we have been talking here at the same time. And quite honestly, within that universe, you need a set of skills of people that are truly qualified to deliver this from the hemp industry itself. This is something that, um, Dr. Um, yes. what, what I think is here in Australia, we have been a very inventive country. Yes. And over the years, we've given away our great ideas to other countries exactly. and they've made yes. money out of them. And we've been the ones who are sitting back and going, oh, aren't we stupid idiots, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's about time we started to take back what really we could. No, but that's a them. very good, that's a very good insight yes. that I, you know, in, in terms of let's not take, give our technology away in hemp. Now, Ramon, you are, you are partly right. The problem with hemp in Australia is that the big dollars have not yet been attracted because everybody is trying to do things in hemp with very little money. Mm. Yes. When you look at your success in Venezuela in oil, you didn't have a shortage of money. No. Never. You see, the, the, where we have, Australia has spent a 27 year last 27 years learning the skills. If the money comes, all the problems can be solved. As David says, we are very innovative and we have a lot of experience and there are experienced people who can solve the problems. You know, and, and provided, provided charts that are, like I have been sharing with everyone I touch and I just recently were talking here that Australia, uh, should embrace the artificial intelligence um, business in order to be able to compete worldwide. 
Michael yeah. Martin, please. We don't, if any of the projects are not thought or conceptualized from the artificial intelligence robotic perspective, we will be or we thinking exactly as you said, as local. We need mm -hmm. to, any money that comes to the, to the hand business to be uh, formulated based on in a large scale industrialized robotics industry. Otherwise, for, we won't be able to compete with China. My business partner, we, we already have uh, a factory in China. They're ready to start uh, producing worldwide. How are we gonna compete with them? Well, they in their factory, they have 3000 people manually. The, on, the only way that we can compete with them is not including our labor for domestic lay, uh, low level work, because what we really need is to hire engineers, designers, all those minds that can help days. us, you know, to create a new industry from scratch. That is what we in the mastermind group think, and that's what we bet on, and that's what we invite our audience to embrace. Now, let me, that I woman that we were speaking about the other day, uh, Robert, uh, Robert Zinner. Zinner, Zinner. Yes. He's, he's a IT specialist over in Canada. And he was, I was speaking to him on Zoom the other night and he said he would like to be able to help us here and make that happen. So we've got people all around the world who are willing to try and help us here in Australia. We just got to bring them all together at the table. We've got to get enough money to make it happen. And that's the, the issue, like you've said before, we don't, we all have good ideas, but we don't have the capital. We don't have the, the, uh, capital that Kane needs here to build a car. You know, we need we need to bring that money to the table and say, well, here's the projects. Here's what we intend to do. We can make it happen here in Australia. All we need is the financial um, momentum to to get it going forward. Okay. And I think that's where we need to target so that we can get all these big businesses in okay. going forward. Yes. Yep. Now, Ramon, there's one issue that I would bring to your attention and to the viewers' attention, that the 3,000 Chinese workers don't worry me because up until 20 years ago, the textile industry was labour intensive. Today, the textile industry is capital intensive because, as you say, robotics, machinery, the, the yarn producing machinery, is all technology requires very few people, the whole process. And once you have the yarn produced from hemp, pure hemp yarn or blend, that can then be sent or made into basic materials and sent to other places in the world. And remember, there's the other issue that hemp is a superior product, a superior product. It is not to be sold at a cheap price. No. Agree. So that the jeans that I am wearing are hemp jeans. Hemp jeans cost $250, not $30. My hemp t-shirt costs $50, not $5. We do not compete against cheap crap cotton. That also destroys the environment. And I can wear my hemp t-shirt, as I say, Kane, I don't know, have you got a hemp t-shirt yet? Because I can wear this hemp t-shirt four weeks in a row, every day, in summer, sweat, no smell. Yeah, I've got one. <laughs> yeah, wash your hands. Yeah. Okay, no smell. Yes, I didn't know that. No. Yes, yes, yes. It's an antimicrobial antibacterial. Uh, uh, yeah. Charles, I believe that we are in the 1980s when Steve Jobs uh, designed the first uh, computer and only a few were able to buy. With time, it, it reached the masses. Um, that's the way it is. Um, yeah. Now, can I, can I share my screen? I want to show Kane a picture. Yes, of course. That, that relates to, that relates to that issue of the 1980s and Steve Jobs and the first computer. Now, let me see if I can share. Yes, yeah. I can. Good. Okay, now, can you see that? Oh, there it is. Yeah. 
That is a motor car cane made out of hemp fiber, hemp composite material. Now, the other thing I want to show you is, just one second. In fact, I'll go back to... That was Steve Jobs, was it? Steve no, Jobs? no, 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 no. That was Lotus. No, no, the, the person that did that behind it. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Okay. Steve Jobs. Okay. Now, I want, to, I want to show you, just one second. I think I have to change this just a sec. I want to show you that evolution that is already happening in our company. Just one second. Now I'll share again. I don't know why this is doing this, everybody. Just one second. Here we go. Now. Okay, yeah. so, oh. yep. I want to show you this. So, in 2012, when I joined this company, this is what the decorticator looked like. I can see it very well. Yeah. 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 Okay, then we did some development work while I was here, and this is what it looked like. <laughs> And then we did some more development work, and this is what it looks like. Getting smaller. Uh, it's bigger. <laughs> and then, and then, um, oh, I thought I had the photo. And then the, the version that we sent to Canada and Pennsylvania was even more developed than this one. In fact, I will show you that in a moment. But Ramon, exactly as you say, and I, I picture where we're going with hemp today, like 1966 when I drove in my first Honda Civic. And you remember, Kane, what the Honda Civic looked like? In this Very well. <laughs> little, little box, have a look yeah. at it now. That's what's going to happen in this. And our machine, which we sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars, it will be half price in 10 years' time. That's the journey. But we must never sell a superior product at a cheap price, and hemp will not be a mass consumer product for 10 to 20 years. Yes, I agree. If you remember the Fairlane, uh, Force Fairlane, that's the longest limousine I made in 1990s, 1994. Everybody said, oh, this is the best car. Why? Because the Fairlane was the only car we've had. Today, if I made a Fairlane, nobody would even look at it. Mm. So no. it changed pretty quickly. Yes. Yeah. Have, 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 have you heard the vehicle called Akira that they manufacture in America, America now? It's, it's a two-person vehicle, but it's designed in such a way that it's aerodynamic, uh, and they can get 1,600 kilometres out of a, one charge. Um, Maybe you haven't. Probably. No, I haven't, no. So that company, they're, they're looking at developing and costing $25,000 American mm -hmm. for vehicle. Uh, and they do the actual thing. Their body is done, I think, in hemp as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's done in a monocoque construction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, if I had the funds, I could build a, uh, a complete car, electric car now, mm -hmm. because they have the facility, have the factory, have mm -hmm. everything there. So how much building. funds do you need? Well, look, I don't know what the price on hemp is. <laughs> I can tell you what my side is, the electrical yeah. and, you know, the, yeah. and the technical side of it, but I have no idea how hemp works. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much hemp I need. If you ask me how much hemp you need, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the hemp. How many dollars a kilo buying this by the meter off the roll? At the moment, just locally. Yeah. But you can get it cheaper from China. Yeah. yeah. Can I, everybody, can I share what the latest version of the decorticator is, please? Oh, you've got it right. Okay. Right. Yeah, here it is. All so right. This one that's gone to Pennsylvania. Can you see that? Right. Yeah. 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 And it's electro, it's Internet of Things established. It speaks back to us in Australia. It's got full electronics, full safety. It's certified for Europe and America. So there's quite a lot of work to go from that to that. Yeah. Mm. So how and much so, an hour can that put out now, Charles? 
two two tons an hour for good crop. And I want Kane to have a look at, you know, what a good crop looks. That's what a good crop, a good fibre crop looks like. Mm. Three, four three. meters high. Yes, yes, yes. Now the the what Peter the, the question of the question um, Kane of of how much hemp you need. Well, a, a motor car. To do an electric vehicle, it would weigh, the body should weigh about 200 kilos. Out of hemp? Yep. Well, actually, that's a lot because uh, carbon fiber. Sorry, 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 I'm just asking you in a, in a. How much would it weigh? That yeah, it would weigh about 100, fiber. just over 100 kilos. In a carbon fiber? In a, no, no, in carbon fiber, yeah, about yeah. 130, 140 kilos. So that's just the panning? Not just so the, the cost. Okay. So the cost of the, the fiber, the raw fiber, because you don't need to decorticate it, you don't need to degum it, that raw fiber for 120 kilos will cost you, will cost you $2.50 a kilo. Like plastic resin. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But that is cheap. the raw That's material. Cheap. That's very cheap. Yeah, and that gives a good return to the farmer. Yeah. And the reason why it's so cheap is because our decorticator does not need retting. This is important for everybody to understand. Retting is the problem with hemp. And retting is a rotting process that is expensive, labor expensive, time expensive. And it can't be done in Australia anyway because it's too hot. It's done in Europe. And there are the decorticators in Europe that sell for $10, $15 million each they require the stalks to be rotten, rotted first before they go through the process at 10 tons an hour. But it's many millions of dollars to buy it. It's a fixed setup. And it's the reason why the fiber is weakened because it's been robbed and because it's been rotted. And that's why our decorticator is so superior because it does not require retting. So it stays as the strongest natural fiber on the planet. And at $2.50 a kilo compared to carbon fiber, which you know the price of. <laughs> Very it, much. It is, that's that's what has been driving our work. Is there, um, uh, Charles, um, this uh, topic today has been very enriching and I'm very sure it will touch many people's heart worldwide. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, and your passion is uh, cont contagious, yes? Yes. Um, I hope that um, many of our dreams co and common goals can be uh, joined together. And I yes. want to share, can I share one picture before I go? Yes. I want to share this, I want to share this, um, this picture, just one second. Um, because I want people to have this idea, this, this um, clear picture of why this is such a wonderful game to play. And just one second, this is driving me nuts. Oh, can you see that now? Yeah, we are, we see it. Good, oh, hang on. This, Hemp has got these 10 categories of products. So, so for anybody watching this, the picture in their mind, I can shut my eyes and tell you that it relates to food from the seed, clothing from the fiber, building and hempcrete from the herd, medicine from the flowers and the buds, fuel, ethanol from the herd, fertilizer from growing the hemp, composite fiber that we've been talking about, body care products, rope and twine and packaging. So the whole packaging industry is solved by this. And so if you have that 10 categories of products that can then lead to many thousands of products, that's why hemp is such a big opportunity. And Ramon, I'll honor you for understanding it. And Peter has been introduced to it. David Shields understands it very well. So thank you for the opportunity to share my passion. I am certainly passionate about it. And my second book is called Passionate Performance. So. I am an expert in passion and I'm passionate about hemp. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much uh, Charles. Um, 
I promise uh, very soon that a bank of projects, uh, something that I have been procrastinating doing the template, I will do it very, very soon. So we can start collecting all those ideas and formulate projects and be able to create a proper bank of ideas. Excellent. Yes? Thank you very oh, much for all of you. your audience uh, worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure.